Good morning for our West Coast attendees and good afternoon for those viewing on the East Coast and good evening and incredibly early morning to our Frankfurt and Perth featured speakers. Welcome to the fifth Transformational Speaker Series webinar, which is a partnership between the California Green Academy and our sustainable transportation blog, Transportica, along with the sustainability publishing pioneer, Island Press, and the internationally renowned Mineta Transportation Institute. The series is a monthly webinar addressing transformational ideas and innovations in transportation design and delivery. For more information, please visit our website at www.calgreenacademy.org forward slash transformational. During the webinar and for the sake of event acoustics, attendees will be muted until the webinar is open to all. Non-featured speakers may post questions in Zoom's chat feature, and we will relay these questions to our presenters. You can also send any tributes to us via email at transformational at calgreenacademy.org. Again, that is transformational at calgreenacademy.org. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the series' YouTube channel immediately following. Our presentation today is titled Dr. Joseph Cott's Legacy, Turning Today's Vision into Tomorrow's Actions, and is a tribute to Dr. Cott's mission of active and sustainable transportation. Dr. Cott had many significant roles, positions, accommodations, accolades, and so forth. For Transportica and the California Green Academy, Dr. Cott was the living embodiment of active and sustainable transportation. He lived and breathed the nuances and intricacies of the discipline and was continuously dedicated to teaching further generations the critical need for such transportation. On today's agenda, we'll begin with our feature speakers. We have five of them and we'll introduce them shortly. Uh, afterward, we'll have an open invitation to any attendees who wanted to provide tributes as well. Following that, we'll actually have some trivia questions um, about Dr. Cott, and we have some great prizes as well for the questions. And then, of course, we'll conclude and provide some more information for interaction. Uh, if you happen to be tweeting today or doing any type of social media posting, um, we would kindly ask that you use the hashtag honoring Dr. Cott. Again, that's uh, hashtag honoring Dr. Cott. Our featured speakers today include Drs. Catherine Cott, Jeff Kenworthy, Peter Newman, and John L. Rennie, as well as statements from one of Dr. Cott's recently graduated students, Remy Mateo. Our first featured speaker is Dr. Catherine Cott, who recently retired as an organizational consultant. Or actually, uh, Dr. Catherine Cott's birthday today. <laughs> So hopefully on the recording that will come out. You'll just have to, you just have to sing it yourself. Oh, no, no, no. I'll <laughs> save you all the trouble. And without further ado, Dr. Cott. Okay, uh, we can go ahead and get started. This is just the introductory slide, so you can move along to the next one, Greg. Um, so as many of you know, uh, Joe grew up in a Chrysler family in Detroit, and this uh, picture postcard is of Dodge, Maine, which doesn't exist anymore. And it's one of the factories where uh, Joe's dad worked at um, the pinnacle of his career. He was a uh, foreman in charge of shipping and receiving in this, uh, in this plant. Joe's brother also drove a short haul truck for his whole life uh, back and forth from Detroit to various locations where there were other Chrysler uh, factories in Indiana and in Canada. And Joe's nephew still works at the Jefferson plant in, uh, in Detroit. Uh, so you can go on to the next slide. Uh, even though they were an auto family, they got Joe on a bike uh, pretty early, as you can see from these uh, photographs of him in his early childhood and as a, a teen. Um, unsafely wearing no helmet and reaching back to wave to whoever it was that was taking the picture. Uh, and you can go on to the next slide. Uh, so um, his, uh, you know, as, as with all of us, his early experiences, I'm sure, influenced his, uh, 
his career choices and the way he thought about the world. You know, he rode a bike as a young person. He was sent to a uh, prestigious Catholic boys' school very, very far away from his family home uh, for a year uh, in his in 10th grade, I think, or his sophomore year in high school. It was, um, you know, no bike lanes. There was very little transit. Um, so he told that story quite often, and I can't help but think that experience uh, really influenced his thinking about what was needed in terms of, of uh, complete streets. They uh, kind of gave up on that idea after a year. He just found it too difficult to um, get himself to school and uh, back under those circumstances. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. So uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other, you know, not that specific experience necessarily, but some of the other influences on um, on Joe's life that I think had uh, a bearing on those things, those qualities that he had that people have uh, really celebrated and continue to mention as important in his uh, in his legacy and as we think about uh, what we can do to go forward and, and carry, uh, carry forth some of the work that he was um, engaged in. He was a first uh, generation college student himself. Um, he, uh, it always resonated with him. I think he particularly enjoyed his experience at San Jose State because many of the students there also were uh, first generation or our first generation. Um, he had a lot of obstacles in his, in his path. His father actually died just as he was entering college and his mother was already uh, unwell with the heart disease that actually uh, ended up being a problem for Joe too, although we didn't, we didn't realize it um, at the time. And so uh, as a young man, mentors were terribly important to him. <clears throat> he had strong mentors in his um, undergraduate program at Wayne in political science. And he also had um, a strong mentor who was uh, part of a social democratic political group uh, he belonged to when he was um, in college. Uh, that you could see the influence of that in, um, in a lot of his thinking as well. I I think. Um, <clears throat> after he finished at Wayne, um, he, well, he planned, he graduated in political science from Wayne, and he planned to become a professor in political science. And then I think, um, and he went to University of North Carolina with a plan to get a PhD in political science. But I think after spending maybe a week reading a page of Marcuse, he decided that um, that wasn't for him and switched into uh, city and regional planning, which ended up just being uh, a great fit for him. So you can go on to the next, um, next slide. He, um, he really fit, it found his true calling, I think, in the city and regional planning program because of all the wonderful, um, all the wonderful elements that planning encompasses. They were all things that Joe was interested in, geography, politics, economics, uh, you know, everything all kind of rolled into one. And uh, pretty early on, he, he got very interested in transportation planning, uh, partly through work and partly through other learning opportunities. So he was really, um, he was always engaged in learner, learning. He was always a learner, I think, um, of the many things I appreciated about uh, Joe, that was that was really up there. He was always um, always engaged and always learning new things. So he uh, he uh, he was also really focused on uh, international learning early. And um, he went uh, when we lived in Maine. He went on a transit tour of Canada. After we moved to California, he went on a bike tour. Uh, to the Netherlands and um, participated in something called the Transatlantic Collaboration Policy Academy in, in uh, Germany. And then, of course, um, he intentionally sought out the uh, best international programs for formal study, culminating in the uh, PhD that he earned under, um, under 
Jeff and Peter here, um, the best of the best. Um, so I think that international component was, was important to him to keep kind of a broad lens and not get caught up in kind of, um, I, I think, American chauvinism, I guess, if that's not too strong a term. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. So, um, <clears throat> as usual, um, dur you know, when Joe died, he was doing a lot of things. Um, he, had, he had kind of cut back on his teaching a little bit. So when he died, he was actually only teaching at one place. I think at, at one point he was up to quite a bit more than that. Um, but, you know, there were a couple of courses he was working on. He was co-teaching one and uh, teaching another one alone. So uh, at San Jose State, they had to do a little scrambling around to get um, people to cover for him. And then I think the um, maybe the most difficult uh, problem fell to the Transportation Choices for Sustainable Communities folks who... Um, had to figure out what to do about a grant that Joe was the principal investigator for. And uh, Chris Farrell took over that responsibility. So they've been pretty swamped. And then Joe had also had a paper accepted at the, uh, at the um, Global Studies Conference at Jagiellonian University in Krakow. And it so happened that his colleague, Michelle de Robertis was finishing up her own PhD in Italy um, around the time that that was happening. So she went ahead and completed the paper and um, gave that on uh, Joe's behalf. I can't believe she did that when she was finishing up her PhD, but she did. And she's back now in, in the US, which is her home. She lives not too far from me. So I, I met her for coffee yesterday. Anyway, they, um, they've been pretty swamped, but they've really stepped up and um, taken over uh, the things that Joe was was working on, um, other than his his teaching. Okay, you can go on to the next um, slide. So a lot of things have been happening in addition to this webinar. A lot of things have been happening to memorialize Joe, and um, I think not only to memorialize Joe, but to help people think about um, how to move forward with some of his ideas and the work that he was, um, he was doing. So we had, um, we had the kind of normal type of memorial after Joe died at his, um, at his church and a reception at our home and um, was very well attended. And then um, the San Jose State people were kind enough to include a memorial in the Masters in Urban Planning graduation ceremony, which was very sweet. Um, so that, that, that event emphasized obviously his teaching and, and mentoring. And then uh, the events that um, California Green Academy is doing this month, um, Joe's birthday month, I think originally Greg had, was thinking that um, his birthday would be a good occasion for remembering him, but it turned out that it was gonna work better on my birthday, but that's fine. <laughs> Uh, so the so I think the focus of these events is maybe a little bit more on his research, especially with um, Jeff and Peter here, who um, who worked with him on his dissertation, and with John here, who is familiar with this work through Transportation Choices as a board member of that uh, organization. <clears throat> so aside from organizing the initial memorial, which um, the catering was my up. Uh, was my daughter's responsibility. If, if you like the food, it was her, <laughs> it was her thing. Um, and then uh, the transportation choices people, I think, um, I think have been just completely overwhelmed with what they've had to do and haven't, have just now started, they and I have just now started thinking, well, what does his legacy look like? What, um, what do we want to do maybe for the rest of a, a memorial year and then kind of say, okay, now we're, um, now our mourning period is done and, um, you know, not like that cleanly divided, but 
how do we move on to honor Joe in our, in our work and in the, um, the things that we, um, our, our activities as we go forward. Um, so Transportation Choices has a couple things that they're working on in addition to the grant that they're finishing up. Um, they have a relationship with the World Transport Policy and Practice Journal and they're planning a special commemorative issue. And I know um, they're looking for papers uh, for that issue. I think Michelle is planning to uh, turn her presentation that she did in Poland into a paper for, for that issue. Um, but if there are things that you're working on that you think would be a good fit, um, I'm sure they would like to know about those as well. And I think they'll, uh, Jeff and Peter, they'll probably also be reaching out to you. Um, they're also thinking about a symposium. And I know, Greg, you have um, your regular September um, seminar that you do. And I think it probably would be a good idea to uh, coordinate those so that they're not competing with, that, with each other or maybe they're sequenced in a way so that they complement uh, each other. So, so that would be good. And I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to kind of be the go-between on that since um, I know the Transportation Choices folks are, are still really quite swamped. Um, I've been working with them too. Joe, um, those of you who knew him well and um, worked with him know that technology wasn't exactly his strong suit, but um, somewhat ironically, he was the one that held all the um, accounts for the social media presence for transportation choices. So <clears throat> getting that um, untangled and figured out is an ongoing project, let's just say. Okay, you can go on to the next um, slide. So um, one, thing that, um, one thing that Joe meant to do with his dissertation data was deposit it in uh, the Curtin data repository, uh, which was um, just getting started as he finished up his dissertation. I don't think it was quite up and running yet. So um, I knew he wanted to do that, but hadn't gotten around to it. So um, Peter helped me get in touch with the uh, librarians there. And um, Jeff took a copy of the data set for sa safekeeping. And um, I'm working with the, uh, with the librarians to get the data exposed. Um, or deposited um, and preserved. So um, I actually, before I became an organization development consultant, I worked in libraries and one of the areas I worked in was in um, digital preservation. So I feel pretty comfortable with, uh, with this part of the project. I think I can, I can chip away at it until it's done. It shouldn't take too long. <clears throat> you can go into the next slide. What's um, maybe a little bit more daunting is Joe's photograph collection, which is both analog and, di and digital. And um, he took a lot of pictures. I, I know there, there are a thousand, if not thousands. Um, there are slides, there are prints, there are digital photos. He took a lot of pictures on the study tours that I mentioned but he also took a lot of transportation related pictures when we were on family vacation. So this shot um, is a particularly famous one in family lore. Um, this was taken before we all had cameras on our phones, even though it does say CD-ROM at the top. So there was something electronic going on or digital. <clears throat> so we had, a, we had a camera with physical film in it and there was one frame left on the on the camera and um, behind us was Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, but this crosswalk was a lot more interesting. So that was the picture that Joe snapped with the last frame on the, on the camera. So um, that just was a, a good example of um, what he was paying attention to when we were on family trips as well as on those uh, trips where he was, he was supposed to be looking at uh, what was going on in the transportation area. So I don't know, I'm imagining that this could be a project. Uh, I need to, I think I need to contact people in the places where he had 
where he that he was affiliated with maybe not just uh, where he taught but also um i'm thinking uh cal where he was involved in their technology transfer program might have the um might have what's needed for a for a photo repository there would be you know digitization involved for the prints and um i think a lot of metadata assignment some of it maybe would even he labeled a lot of things pretty well but the excuse me there are some that that um aren't well labeled so they might have to even be crowdsourced so that's kind of a big project i think that would need to be um <coughs> figured out so um if you have ideas about that i would welcome them and that's again something i'll just be looking at over time and and talking talking to various people about Okay, um, you can move on to the final slide. Um, this is really more about his, um, about Joe as a person and kind of what went into his, you know, kind of the way he lived his life, the way he did his work. He, um, <clears throat> I think he instilled in his, um, you know, he had to hit his own life experiences. So, uh, you know, we all learn from our own personal experiences, but I think we can all think about what we want to take from, from him as well as we uh, move forward. He, I think he instilled in his students and his coworkers a passion for democracy. You know, if you were a Facebook friend of his, how he felt about that and um, work that benefits the community, which was an emphasis of his. Uh, the next generation can, uh, can build upon and extend uh, his, the work that he did as a practitioner, a researcher, a teacher, and a mentor. And I think maybe the combination of those things you don't always see, so it's worth being thoughtful about what he brought from what he learned in practice into the academy and what he learned about theory that he brought into practice and how those things fit together. Jeff, you know, one of the things you and I communicated about was his um, teaching material too. And I think I'm a little bit stuck about that um, because it's technically, I think it's a work for hire. So kind of thinking about how that gets uh, preserved is may, might be a little bit of a challenge, but certainly something we're thinking about. And, you know, a lot of his PowerPoints and so forth are, um, are still around. So those are, those are worth thinking about preserving too. How do we go about that? He, you know, he was, um, he exhibited kind of a, a kind of fearlessness too. I mean, the idea that of doing the PhD so, um, so late in life and, um, you know, setting up a project that was pretty daunting and complex at a time when he was, you know, in the middle of a lot of other things as well. Um, so I don't know, as, um, as we think about carrying his work forward, I think, um, it's really important to think about his values as well as his technical competence. Um, one of his students came up at the San Jose State graduation and said that as a result of Joe's teaching, he saw his own work as a spiritual quest. Like making me kind of emotional. Um, he worked hard, he, you know, we complained about that a lot to him about how his shoulder was always to the grindstone, but he did always find time for those dogs who are now mine and um, baseball. And I have to apologize because this is actually the giant stadium, which he, you know, he enjoyed going to games there too, but the Tigers were his team and he would go, go see them play in Oakland when they, when they came. Um, he loved to hike. So we spent a lot of time in nature and his uh, faith was important to him too. So I think it's a legacy to celebrate and to continue. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, much appreciated. Uh, our next featured speaker is Dr. Jeff Kenworthy, Professor of Sustainability and Sustainable Cities for Curtin University, 
and Curtin Sustainability Policy Institute and a guest professor at the Frankfurt University Applied Sciences and Goth University. Dr. Kenworthy also served as Dr. Cott's dissertation supervisor at Curtin. Dr. Kenworthy, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Greg. And thank you very much, Catherine, for that lovely overview and insight into more than what I knew, knew about Joe. I, um, I, it was interesting because um, Joe came to us, you know, as a student who was never really at the campus. And um, I only met him once in Perth, well, over a period of time, he stayed for some time. Um, and, uh, and then only another time in San Francisco when I stayed with your with you and with you and Joe and your family, and uh, um, so it's quite interesting that we were able to sustain a relationship over, gosh, almost ten years to get this get this thesis done. And as you said, it was an incredibly complex piece of work. And as you spoke and you you reflected on all the things that Joe was interested in through his life, I, um, I could see very clearly then the, the most amazing detail and the breadth of the thesis that he covered. He, he looked at all the, the physical planning, the environmental, the traffic, the urban design, the landscape architecture. <laughs> and then he got into all the social, the political stuff, the economic stuff by, look, by doing surveys with people who are infinitely more difficult to get information from than, than measuring things physically. So in the end, the, the, the thesis was, was so big and yet I had at no point did I ever feel that I should restrain Joe because he had this passion for learning and he had this, I could see that he had the intellectual ability and, and the energy to carry it through. The difficulty of course was then at the end to, to put it all together and to tie it into a story that made sense and that would, that would meet the requirements of a PhD. But we got that done, and I think it's I for, for me I I think the topic was incredible. I'll just say this first. I think the topic was incredibly important. This this idea of of streets and how to make them better. When you consider that in in most cities, streets occupy you know between fifteen and thirty percent of the land area, and they are the they are the the conduits through which we all move every day, they, they determine the, our perception of cities. And so doing a thesis on how to make streets better is as an in, incredibly worthwhile um, piece of work to undertake. And, and he undertook it to, to a breadth and level of detail that to me is still mind-boggling. Um, there's so much written about streets by so many different disciplines and so many dif different authors. And to try to synthesize that into something that makes sense and then be able to say, well, what am I adding to that? What am I doing to make this an original contribution to knowledge was, was extraordinary. And for me, I, I can't separate that that work from who Joe was from the very beginning I could see that Joe was a person of substance he was a lovely man he was a kind a caring a well-mannered compassionate person who also embodied energy and intellectual rigor and those those qualities are what sustained him. Those spiritual qualities are what sustained him in this absolutely magnificent effort. And, and all the work that Joe has done subsequently in his teaching and so on, 
what people are learning from Joe is, is not just about the topic. It's not just about cities or making better streets, but it's also about how to be a good person, how to be a moral person, how to guide people in a, in a way that is more, that is decent and, and spiritual. And that for me is, is the most significant part of his legacy. Um, that's who he was. He had the head and he had the heart. And when you, in, when you embark on a piece of work like this, if you don't have the head and the heart, you fail. And he, he had both. And he was able to communicate that to people. And that's what people loved about him. That's what his students loved about him. That's why we're, that's why we're remembering him today for his content, but also for, for him as a, as a human being. Um, and I, I, there was a little story that I wrote for the, for the book club about when I, when I stayed with you, you and Joe back in 2008, I was interviewed for, for a, a program about the demolition of the freeway in Seoul and the restoration of the river. It's probably the most significant uh, project that's ever been done in the way of restoring streets to what or restoring a corridor. And I thought that when I thought about this and afterwards, I thought it was very symbolic for me that that, that program, thanks to you and to Joe, was recorded, or well, my part of it was recorded in your yard because that's what, that's what Joe stood for. And, and I thought it was more than serendipity that, that it happened then. And in, in terms of where we, where we can take this, um, I thought it was very symbolic today, the day of the webinar, the day of your birthday, <laughs> and the day we're talking about Joe's contribution to complete streets and more sustainable streets. An email came in that, was from Smart Growth America, actually from the director of National Complete Streets Coalition, Smart Growth America, saying that there is a bill before the American Congress to create the Complete Streets Act of 2019. And uh, if I just read you a little bit about it. In 2016, Massachusetts created a state program that encouraged cities and towns to pass complete street policies and then funded projects around the state. It's been a roaring success. And now that state program is the model for a new federal bill. Prior to the Massachusetts program, just 25 communities had complete street policies on the books. Today, 201 have state approved plans and more are in the works. The Complete Streets Act of 2019 in Congress could replicate that success nationally, but only if we tell Congress they need to act. And for me, in terms of something that might be immediately done, to, to try to pull together um, something from Joe's thesis, which is very visual, very communicable, that could be put into that process of trying to get that bill passed. Because his contribution is, is, is really... a. a a watershed. It, it, is, it is the single most comprehensive, I think, about what complete streets should be and why they are needed, why they are good, and so on. So that would be one thing that's being called for right at the moment, right at this moment. I, uh, I miss Joe, and I was, yeah, very very devastated to hear um, that he passed on, but, uh, but I feel that his spirit, that his, the work that he's done definitely uh, lives on. And I think that's all we can ask in this life is to, is to make a contribution with our head, with our heart, and to try and have, make it have as much meaning as possible. So, that's it for me. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you so much for that.
Uh, our next spe featured speaker is Dr. Peter Newman, AO, who serves as the John Curtin Distinguished Professor of Sustainability at Curtin University and Curtin Sustainability Policy Institute. In 2014, Dr. Newman was awarded the Order of Australia, one of the nation's highest awards given for chivalry and meritorious service. Dr. Newman was awarded an Officer of the Order for his contributions to urban design and sustainable transport, particularly related to the saving and rebuilding of Perth's rail system. Like Dr. Kenworthy, Dr. Newman also served as Dr. Cott's dissertation supervisor, and we are told that Dr. Newman has a fish story to share with us. Dr. Newman. Yeah. Um, thank you, and um, it is uh, quite a moving time uh, for me as well. Uh, Joe was a good friend, and certainly uh, uh, it is a time to remember him. Um, but I also remember that it's now 40 years ago this year that uh, Jeff and I were involved in saving the Fremantle Railway, which started our public careers in terms of getting a different perspective on uh, our, the future of cities. And uh, 30 years ago that our book um, came out, Cities and Automobile Dependence, where we first defined uh, the, the degree to which cities committed to the car and accommodated the car and was published um, uh, also in the Japa article that came out and was very controversial and personally confronting for us as people attacked us personally for destroying the American dream, um, or as Catherine said, American chauvinism. Uh, the um, whole idea that cities could, uh, instead of accommodating the car constantly to manage the car, uh, was something that we sailed into at that point in, in a global sense. And uh, people like Joe uh, found our work and, and found a home for his values to be expressed and for his technical skill to be uh, turned. He, he did it as well as anyone. And we've had many, many students uh, since. But uh, let me just say that the first slide from Catherine, the slow point of the slide um, about traffic calming, essentially did uh, highlight that whole idea. Um, and we found when we first came out with our work that we couldn't find a traffic engineer anywhere in the world who would agree to manage the car instead of accommodating it, that increasing traffic capacity was the world of the traffic engineer. And uh, now this could have just been the fact that we were rather dominated by America and uh, Australia where we had totally um, taken that um, uh, approach and were rather uh, dominated by it in our cities. But it, it is extraordinary to see the change that has, a hap that has happened and that wonderful um, last uh, image you gave, Jeff, of the uh, Federal Act on Complete Streets is showing that there is a major step forward that's been taken. Um, and it is driven by personal values as much as it is by the technical data that we get on our cities. And Jeff and I have always had this view that uh, it is our um, deeper spiritual level that uh, you have to turn to. And uh, finding that with, with Joe and Catherine, I would say, um, the way I also stayed at their house and they at ours, um, and Joe, when coming out to, to Perth for his uh, work uh, occasionally would stay with us. Um, and the fish story is that um, 
we went away and left the house with him and we had two things that he had to do. He had to look after the fish and he had to look after our dog. Now, uh, it seems that he had a particular penchant for uh, managing the dogs. He greatly loved our dog, Milo, and he, that love was returned. He thought he was the first person in the world to be so greatly loved by a dog. Um, um, but that was our, the character of our, our dog, Milo. Um, and, and he deeply remembered uh, that uh, relationship. But uh, he actually killed our fish uh, with love. <laughs> he overfed them. Um, and uh, we were very glad that he didn't uh, also kill our dog, but uh, with love. Um, but uh, so we, we held that against Joe <laughs> frequently. Um, but um, l let me just take that fish analogy. Fish is, is a spiritual uh, symbol, of course, of, mm -hmm. uh, of Christian values. And um, uh, I also go to a, ch a local church um, and on Sunday I was actually asked to give the, uh, the sermon and did so about the city uh, and its values and particularly the uh, section in, in the last book of the Bible in Revelation about what the city of the future is where there are two images given, one which is called um, Babylon or the city of man the city of frivolous consumption, which is under great judgment and, and collapses. And the other one is the city that comes from heaven and is made of diamonds. And uh, I was reflecting on this and I have read uh, various theologians about it, but it's essentially the city that is made with our work because diamonds are human, humanly created. They don't, it's not a, a kind of natural phenomenon. You have to find them dig them up, uh, clean them up, and then do this extraordinary artisanal work that, that creates the diamond that sparkles and gives, gives life and lasts for generations. It is a symbol of love that is given to, uh, to, to symbolize that love. And it is an extraordinary legacy that is given um, and represents, I think, the, uh, the, that the way the city is made up of diamonds like Joe's. And he certainly did create a diamond of hope. Uh, diamonds are something that gives us hope and we, we pass on that legacy. And everybody has an opportunity to create a diamond. Joe's certainly did. And the depth of his uh, spiritual quest, as much as the technical is clearly evidenced in, in his work and, and in those slides and in, in everything we remember about what he taught, um, where he was able to, to give a sense of what the city could be. And that is a different city. And it's one that we, we, we can claim and, and, uh, and build uh, here as well as into the eternity uh, that he now is part of. So the head and the heart is there, as Jess says it, um, but it is important to remember that it is the infusing of those personal values into his thesis and his, uh, which, which really should become a book of some kind that can be simply and easily communicated and given to people because that is um, that is his diamond and one which we should treasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, our next featured speaker is Dr. John L. Rene, AICP, who is an Associate Professor of Urban Design and Urban and Regional Planning at Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Rene also serves as director of the University's Center for Urban and Environmental Solutions and is a current board member for Transportation Choices for Sustainable Communities Research and Policy Institute, nonprofit Dr. Todd Kofan. Rene, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you to Catherine as well. Um, 
and uh, to Jeff and Peter uh, for letting me uh, part participate in this with you. Um, Jeff, Joe and I ended up in Perth for the same reasons, and, and that's because um, we shared a lot of similar uh, career um, goals and um, interests, and, um, and we both uh, discovered the work of Jeff and Peter um, in, in uh, Fremantle, um, Western Australia, which both uh, led us at separate points in our lives to uh, seek out the opportunity to work with them. And uh, we first met, my wife and I were there, and, and, and we first met with Joe when he was working on his dissertation with Jeff. And, um, you know, being uh, both Americans in Australia, obviously, you know, had a lot in common. And uh, would discover over the years how much we really did have in common. Um, Joe uh, asked me to serve on uh, as one of the founding board members of the um, Transportation Choices for Sustainable Communities Research and Policy Institute, which I, I still serve on. And um, it was it was through that uh, opportunity that I really got to know Joe the best. Um, but I also was able to relate to him and got to know him uh, through several other ways. Um, and um, one of those was, you know, I, I kind of learned a lot about Joe um, through his posts on Facebook. Uh, we were friends on Facebook and he was fairly prolific with um, posting his views on all sorts of different opinions. And, um, and, and you know, we come from a similar background. Um, you know, in terms of our, our views on politics, uh, I'm, I come from a similar Catholic faith background. And Joe and I had a number of conversations over the years about our, our views on our faith as, as um, kind of a cat, Catholics uh, and rectifying that with the, um, you know, the, the current politics happening at the time in the United States, which uh, certainly, you know, didn't quite represent um, you know, representative by either of the two dominant parties. And at the same time, you know, how our, our passion for urban planning and sustainability and how all that was related. So I had a, a number of conversations with Joe about a lot of these issues. Um, you know, what was most important, though, was not just Joe's ability to be um, a sounding board or to post about particular issues. Um, Joe was very much somebody who did things and made a difference in, in, in people's lives um, and, and really was making a, a strong difference through the Transportation Choices nonprofit um, in so many different dimensions that span the academic to the professional arenas. Um, and, um, you know, I was very impressed always with his pursuit of, of lifelong education and his thirst for knowledge. Um, in 2010, um, I had encouraged Joe to apply for a position, a faculty position at the University of New Orleans, where I was a, a, a faculty member at the time. And Joe applied for the position, and I was the chair of the search committee. I was very excited. I want to read for you um, some of Joe's own words dated February 16, 2010, in his um, letter to the search committee. Um, Joe says, quote, my career in urban planning has combined the roles of practitioner, educator, and scholar. I've worked in public agencies and for consulting firms in four states and have taught both university, universities within the Stanford program on urban studies and graduate students at the University of, the, of Southern Maine's Muskie School for Public Service. I hold bachelor's degrees in political science from Wayne State University in Detroit, as well as master's degrees in urban regional planning from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and in both transport planning and traffic engineering from the Institute of Transport Studies at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. At the time, he was also finishing up his PhD at Curtin University with Jeff as well. Much of my career has been spent in research, writing, and giving presentations. I have an extensive professional network and enjoy mentoring young people entering the profession of urban and regional planning. 
I am interested in the physical and social determinants of sustainable cities. My doctoral research on sustainable streets has been multidisciplinary, informed by scholarship in urban planning, architecture, traffic engineering, urban design, and public health planning. I would like to extend my research on sustainable streets to an investigation of successful car-free spaces and indeed car-minimized cities. I envision my next research project to be a study of car-free streets in North America and Europe. Why do some of these streets perform well and others flounder? What are the physical elements of urban transport and other system supports needed for successful car-free or car-minimized place? My, Teaching interests include planning for sustainable cities, comparative urban and regional transport and land use systems, stakeholder engagement, and urban and regional planning, and research methods in urban regional planning. I enjoy engaging with and mentoring students, unquote. Now, Joe came out and interviewed for the position and did extremely well. Um, he was very well liked. And unfortunately, I, I hate to say, um, you know, when the search committee met, of course, these are usually confidential matters, but I'm no longer at that university, so it doesn't really matter. Um, Joe suffered from age discrimination. Uh, the only factor that he didn't have going for him was that he was significantly older than all the other candidates. And for that reason, which frankly is illegal, um, my other colleagues did not vote for him. I only had one vote, so of course, I didn't make the decision. But um, that was the reason why Joe um, did not end up uh, getting offered a position at the University of New Orleans. Um, it didn't matter though, because Joe and I remained close and the work that he did in the Bay Area was, was transformational. Um, the Transportation Choices nonprofit was still at its infancy at that point and would have probably not been able to achieve the sorts of things that it has achieved um, had Joe um, you know, and, and Catherine moved to New Orleans. Um, outside of the, um, the, the professional arena, um, you know, I, I just want to say that Joe was just an extraordinary rock. He always made you feel special and important. Joe, when he talked to me, um, made me feel like what I had to say was, you know, the most important thing in the world. He had that ability to put 100% of his attention and focus on folks and to be an incredible listener when they were talking and to be able to digest what they were saying and to add to that his own important thoughts and relevance. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't, I, I knew Joe, you know, I felt like I knew him personally, but I remember one, one aspect, uh, one event, which was very tragic um, when, when Joe um, lost his son. Um, I, I remember, uh, you know, how difficult that was. And it was, you know, I remember reaching out to Joe and, and emailing with him and talking with him during that part of his life. And I was just Im so impressed about how Joe was able to radiate positivity through what is probably the most difficult situation that anybody could ever experience in their life. And when I heard Joe pass, it was incredibly surprising and shocking. We were talking about working on some research proposals together. Um, there were always, of course, you know, going to be a many number of things that are left unfinished when someone is taken, um, unfortunately, too early in life. Joe was very young. But um, the one thing that I, I have to say was, you know, I, I felt a, an inner peace knowing that Joe didn't leave many stones unturned in his life. He he treated people the way that our faith teaches you to treat people. He treated the environment in the way that our faith teaches you to treat the environment. And, and because of Joe's incredible hard work, the way he treated people, his positivity, 
Joe made the world a better place. And whether we live for 60 years or 100 years, it really doesn't matter because truly the most important thing is to leave the world a better place than when you got here. And Joe will always be near and dear to my heart and inspire me to try to achieve some of the things that he achieved in his life. Um, most notably, how he interacted with and inspired so many people. And I, I will always be grateful for Joe for all that he has taught me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, our last featured speaker is Remy Mateo, who recently graduated from Presidio Graduate School with a Master of Public Administration and Sustainable Management. Remy is a mobility advocate for the East Los Angeles Regional Center, where he teaches transportation independence for those with disabilities. Remy was a student of Dr. Kotz and served as chair of Transport Presidio, a sustainable transportation student association under the faculty leadership of Dr. Cott. Uh, unfortunately, Remy had a last minute client meeting arise, so he has provided the following statement for today, and I'll go ahead and read it as well. As Dr. Cott was a friend, mentor, and professor to me, I had the pleasure of attending his class at Presidio Graduate School, as well as having him as a mentor as part of Transport Presidio. One of my cherished memories of him was when we attended the World Energy Innovation Conference at Tesla's headquarters, and we discussed the future of public transportation. My passion lies in sustainable transportation, especially as it affects the most vulnerable populations, such as elders, youth, and those with disability. Dr. Kopp was an amazing person with I can't say a word about many accomplishments, a visionary, a family man, and a friend. I miss him and will continue to remember him. God bless Dr. Cott. All right, now if any uh, attendee would like to provide a tribute, please feel free to uh, speak up on that. We don't have any emails sent in. Um, I'll just give you minute if anyone wanted to speak up. Okay, we'll actually move on. This is the, uh, and anything sent to us afterward will be included in the uh, posted video as well. Uh, here's one of the, the fun things we like to do. And as you see the picture uh, at our conference, transportation and the triple bottom line. Um, so every session we would have the presenter uh, award a book to one of the student attendees. And actually what was interesting is uh, by sheer coincidence, uh, the book selected for Dr. Cott's panel was actually The End of Automobile Pendence uh, by Drs. Newman and Kenworthy. And uh, also by sheer luck, the winner was actually one of his current students. So that was pretty neat uh, when that happened. Let me go ahead. So we have some questions today, and we're going to ask you, uh, this is about Dr. Cott's work. Uh, if you do feel that you have a a conflict of interest, no need to respond, but other than that, uh, feel free to. We have actually five packages that we're gonna give away as a prize for those who answer correctly. Uh, the first is actually the documentary by Ken Burns, Baseball. Uh, Dr. Cott, um, I was told, would read the Encyclopedia of Baseball, was a very dedicated baseball fan, so we have that provided, and this is the updated version with a 10th DVD. We also contacted the Detroit Tigers and they are donating a fan package. Uh, Dr. Cott was a lifelong Tigers fan, so we're very excited about that. Um, Dr. Cott uh, enjoyed going to his birthday, on his birthday, July 15th, Moss Beach Distillery. 
he would enjoy an IPA, sliders, and especially the view of the California coast. So Moss Beach Distillery has donated uh, a gift certificate to the winner. Uh, he also enjoyed reading about early American history and its institutions. So we have three books here, a suite, that are donated. Uh, they are Democracy in America by Alex de Tocqueville, one of the fundamental American uh, publications. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, The First Social Scientist by John Elster. And a book that he was reading uh, just recently, 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus by Charles C. Mann. And our last package is something we like to call Transport's Triple Crown. And that is uh, three books by Drs. Newman and Kenworthy, Cities and Automobile Dependence, Sustainability in Cities Overcoming Automobile Dependence, and finally, The End of Automobile Dependence by both. Well, let's go ahead and, again, we have five questions. Uh, when, the, when someone responds and speaks up, uh, please feel free to tell me what package that you'd like to Oh, here's your prize. So here is first questions. All right, I got to get rid of that one. You folks who know that. Um, okay, uh, besides Curtin University, name one of the other three universities Dr. Cott attended. Does anyone know? University of North Carolina. Yes. <laughs> So, yes, he attended University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, I believe that was for a master's in engineering and urban planning. City and regional planning. Oh, city and regional planning. Mm -hmm. And what gift package would you like? Well, whatever gift package I choose, I would like to donate to somebody uh, in, in, in Catherine's world. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, probably the, uh, the what, what was it, the Moss Beach Distillery? I can't attend there, but... Um, oh, but why not? I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that some needy person would like to have some IPA at Moss Beach Distillery. So, so let me donate it to you, Catherine, and you can decide who to give it to. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, the next question. Uh, Dr. Cott served as the Chief Transportation Officer for what city? Palo Alto? Yes, from 1999 to 2005. And what package would you like? Well, let's see, um, given that uh, I, given that I'd like to learn more about Joe's uh, interest in, in history, I'm going to pick the, the, uh, the, the three book package that he was reading. I already own the, the, the trifecta from Newman and Kenworthy. So uh, I'll go, I'll go and learn a little bit more about uh, the history of America. Okay. Perfect. Next question besides San Jose state university, Name two of the four other institutions Dr. Cott regularly lectured at. Stanford University. And the second one, um, probably in LA. I don't know, used to be LA up. <laughs> um, but, but certainly um, uh, the, there was a college as well in, in, uh, in San Francisco. I can't remember the name. Sorry, I'm not got not getting it. What was your first response? Stanford. He did. Okay. Definitely, definitely there. Well, I'll go ahead and actually give you that. Uh, the yes, yeah, Stanford, Sonoma State University, Mineta Transportation Institute, and the San Francisco uh, Institution was Presidio Graduate School. Ah, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, so, what package would you? Like for your prize? Um, well, I do have the trifecta. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have gone for the history, but uh, um, so uh, what, what, 
I am a sports too, fan. Too bad, too bad it's not a footy, uh, a footy of a footy <laughs> video uh, series, right? Joe was really getting into. <laughs> the Detroit Tigers are kind of like the, uh, are kind of like the Dockers, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> they lose regularly, do they? <laughs> <laughs> They're the, they're the, they're the, they're the underdogs that everyone wants to win. Yeah, they have good values. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear. Yeah, well, I'm happy to get the uh, Detroit package. Yeah. And we have two more questions uh, remaining. Again, the documentary by Ken Burns, baseball, and also the. Uh, uh, Trifecta uh, publication by Drs. Newman and Henry. And let's see. What was the name of Dr. Cott's consulting firm? Now, audience, jump in here. We've already got our <laughs> <gift>. <laughs> I'll I'll uh, I'll uh, win that for my um, for someone else who was on until just a few minutes ago, and who's a baseball fan. <laughs> Cod planning consultants. Yeah, absolutely. What was, it, what was it called again, Catherine? Just Cod planning consultants. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, he had a lo a KPC logo that someone designed for him. You know he. He um, he did some work under that um, consulting firm, but it was mostly um, parking studies, which wasn't his thing. And I think at that point, he realized that the um, not-for-profit was a much better avenue for what he um, what he wanted to accomplish. But he did work for another uh, planning uh, consulting firm because I knew, I know when I was collecting data, I got stuck a few times and I asked Joe and he put out a, a message to people that he used to work for in another firm. That was a bigger mm -hmm. consulting firm. He did. He worked for two other consulting firms. Nelson Nygaard was one. That's the one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I forget and forgot. I'd have to look at his CV. <laughs> I'd have to cheat. <laughs> yeah, Nygaard is the one that I'm thinking of, but I just couldn't couldn't think of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have his CV here. Um, let's see. He worked for Wilbur Smith. That's right. Yeah, that's a big. Uh, Nelson Nygaard is kind of local to the Bay Area, but Wilbur Smith is big, a big national consulting firm. Well, Nelson Nygaard has actually, I think, expanded, and, and I've, I've always respected them as one of the most innovative consulting companies in the country. And mm -hmm. same with Wilbur Smith, both really good consulting companies. Wilbur Smith started the rot, though. They were the ones who did the first studies around the world. Almost every city in the world had a Wilbur Smith study done showing how they should be building freeways everywhere. And uh, <laughs> every, every Australian city had one. And... Uh, the early activists um, in our cities were about trying to stop the Wilbur Smith plans. <laughs> anyway, it uh, it changed, fortunately. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, see. The question we have remaining is, again, the trifecta. Uh, <laughs> so whoever wants to answer this, Dr. Cott was a fellow for what International Professional Association? I have no idea. <laughs> Transportation engineers. Yes. Is that, was that it? ITE? Yes. ITE fellow? Yeah. And I would be very keen to give the trifecta to our friend in LA who can use that to advantage, I'm sure. Oh, perfect. Yeah, he must be working in a tough environment dealing with universal access in, in Los Angeles, East Los Angeles in particular. Well, it's interesting. Surprisingly, Los Angeles is undergoing really a, a transformation 
with their system. Voters have actually um, approved $120 billion, basically renovate uh, the entire metro system mm -hmm. and make it as sustainable as possible. And that was actually something um, I had Dr. Cott for two classes, one of which was uh, at San Jose State. And he talked regularly about that, how uh, it's just kind of awkward to him now that if you want to look at good local, you know, and regional transportation planning, LA is now becoming the model. So it feels kind of weird when he tells that to other Bay Area people, but I mean, that is becoming the truth where LA is really ditching, uh, you know, their car, car, love for the car. Yeah. And I'd just say that I think the trifecta is symbolized by LA uh, in terms of the, the first edition, um, mm. the city and automobile dependence. LA, LA was very much the, the symbol of the city that had totally given itself up to the car. And uh, that process of change that started, we began to document in the, the blue book. And finally, in the we do talk about that transformation in, in the end of automobile dependence. Uh, it is very symbolic. And um, I, I, I think it's wonderful to see how quickly a city can turn around and the, um, the commitment that's been made and the, how much that's been driven from the bottom through the, the uh, community-based groups um, that have driven this agenda and, and turned it into a political process. and 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 then into infrastructure that is uh, significantly um, changing the nature of the city uh, every day. It's making it better. There are a lot of diamonds in LA these days. Mm. The one, just one other fact about LA that a lot of people find surprising is that it's actually the densest metropolitan area in the United States. It's actually denser than the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area and it's a it's a kind of it's not hasn't got the traditional you know mushroom style peak of density like new york but it's a kind of a more uniform pretty packed in um kind of urban fabric so it actually has an incredible um basis to become a transit metropolis if it puts in the transport infrastructure to match its density, because there are cities with similar densities that have got a lot more transit usage. So LA has got the possibilities and it's really great to see that they're moving ahead in some way. They have been investing in that infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny that, oh, go ahead, Dr. Redding. No, I was just going to say, you know, interestingly over the years, you know, kind of thinking about the work that Joe did and the work that Peter and Jeff have done is that the biggest resistance, I think, came from the academics that were based in Los Angeles. Um, you know, uh, Gordon and Richardson and, uh, you know, some of the other folks there were the most critical about the kind of work uh, that Peter and Jeff were promoting. But it, were, it was actually the, the folks like Joe, who were practitioners in California, who were the ones that were actually making the difference to, to, to make this transition. You know, they, they were the folks who were really leading the, 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 the way in terms of transitioning a society from being an auto-oriented society to one that is a lot more sustainable. So I, I just wanted to point that out. Mm. Well, I love that you actually brought that up because as I mentioned, uh, I had Dr. Cott uh, for sustainable transportation planning at San Jose State. And our, while we had other books and articles, our official textbooks was End of Automobile Dependence. Um, but Dr. Cott actually read a quote from all of us. And this is a very famous quote, so I'll go ahead and read it. And it's, uh, it's the reaction of uh, Dr. Ken Werther's and Newman's first book. And it says, quote, NK have written a troubling paper. Their distortions are not innocent because the uninformed may use them as ammunition to support extensive plans for a central city revitalization and rail transit projects or stringent land use controls in a futile attempt to enforce urban compactness. Perhaps NK would be well advised to seek another planet, preferably unpopulated, 
where they can build their compact cities from scratch with solar powered transit. That actually sounds like a dream to me, but uh, the, the point of Dr. Cotton showing us that was the fact that you may even have your colleagues or significant um, you know, counterparts involved with not believing in what you want to go forward with or you know, just really holding you back, but instead go forward with what your dream is, what your vision is, especially with regards to sustainable transportation planning. Uh, in most cases, the people in the science are on your side. I enjoy that we started the class by hearing that quote. And I'm going to uh, share a quick tribute as well. Um, so in his class, we had our major project was um, uh, something we had to develop about sustainable and active transportation around the campus. And unfortunately, uh, San Jose is kind of Northern California's Los Angeles. Uh, it just shot in population after World War II and became, you know, epicenter of the suburban movement in Northern California. And now things are changing. So we presented a project uh, for the spring 2016 semester, and it had three major um, uh, goals with it. One was creating a bi-directional lane around the campus. This way it was easier to get around uh, the campus on bike or foot. Uh, San Jose State University is actually the largest employer in downtown San Jose. So that's where our efforts were situated. We also wanted a safe connection through the Deardon Station, which is actually um, uh, it's the second busiest uh, transportation hub in Northern California, but there are billions of dollars going into and it's reinvest or going into development uh, within the next 10 years, actually almost another billion being uh, put up by Google as well. Google has chosen to build right next to the station. And so that will really become kind of a grand central for Northern California. So one project was uh, San Fernando street, very busy making it more protected for bicyclists. And our third, objective was improved bicycle infrastructure in downtown. Uh, we used a lot of international examples uh, and also locally we actually used uh, the city of Davis and UC Davis example. So we thought that was a good presentation. It would just remain with the class. Well, that actually caught the attention of Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. They're a major advocacy organization. Uh, this Thursday will be their 2019 summit and they've actually quickly become kind of the premier organization in policy summits for uh, bicycling and active transportation and so forth. Um, they were also lucky the citizens of Santa Clara County recently passed a measure that put 500 million into bicycle infrastructure over a decade and that is largest um, uh, bond to date uh, for bicycle infrastructure in the U.S. So what was interesting is we were asked to present at that uh, for the executive board and there was Colin Hain, that's in picture right there, um, who's actually from Los Angeles as well, but currently he was, or at the time he was the deputy executive director of the Bicycle Coalition and he's currently now the public information op manager for the uh, San Jose's Department of Transportation. Another interesting thing was one of our teammates, there was four people, one of them was Peter Rice. He was uh, an intern for the city and he's actually now a transportation planner uh, for San Jose DOT as well. And I was just in San, downtown San Jose last month to attend the convocation for the Mineta Transportation Institute. And I just happened to notice that around the university, there's a lot of really nice bicycle infrastructure that's going up. I just thought, you know, it's kind of weird and trying not to think too much about it. I kind of thought, well, it kind of looks like our project, but it's probably not. So, you know, just calm down. Uh, and then I look at the Better Bikeway Plan for downtown San Jose, and that is uh, currently showing projects that are undergoing from last year and this year to improve the bicycle infrastructure. And I realized, okay, this actually has a lot of detail that we had in our project. Again, not claiming any tie, but it's just, it's really interesting. That's kind of neat. But so much detail that I actually emailed Peter and said, hey, I was in you know, downtown San Jose the other day. 
I noticed this. It sounds crazy, but you know, just curious. Uh, do they know you worked on a project like that? And his response was, quote, they are going to turn the protected bike lane around SJSU into a two-way bikeway, and they refer to that as our school project. Well, so feel free to put that on your resume, Pete. <laughs> so I was not expecting that. It's not on my resume, but I just want to remind you folks now that from now on, when you're in downtown San Jose and you see that improved bicycle infrastructure and you see a new generation of, uh, you know, anyone realizing that bicycle is a great form of mobility, just realize a lot of that came from the scholarship of Dr. Cott. So you have a physical legacy in downtown San Jose. Dr. Cott and what he's talking about. Hey, Greg, what would be the possibility of trying to speak to the city to find a way to get the bikeway named uh, the, the Joseph Cott Bikeway? Well, I do think we have some insiders who could possibly help with that. Um, uh, Colin as well, even though he, well, he attended San Jose State, but he didn't attend it for urban and regional planning, but he had worked and spoke with Dr. Cott many times. So he's more than familiar with Dr. Cott, uh, his legacy and mission as well. So that's something definitely we have insiders with. I also, my former student, um, Peter Bennett, um, is a transportation specialist um, for the, the San Jose um, Department of Transportation's Bicycle and Pedestrian Program. So I'll reach out to him as well. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to just add that the way, the way that Joe and I got to know each other, according to Joe, when I spoke to him, was that he actually organized that I, I didn't know Joe at that time and I didn't know he was behind it, but he actually organized for me to give a talk in San Jose or Palo Alto. I can't even remember which one it was, but I know I it was. I think it was San Jose. I remember him talking about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure because I remember, you know, I gave this talk and it was shortly after that, well, some years after that Joe, um, applied to do a PhD with me, but he'd actually organized that um, in 1992. And I was able, as a result of going to San Jose to, to speak based on Joe's work behind the scenes that I didn't even know about, I was able to, to take a series of photographs in San Jose when they were developing their light rail system. And I used those in many lectures for many years to come as evidence of how an automobile orientated city can begin to transform itself, particularly in the central area and to make it more livable and beautiful and to add quality transit and to do transit oriented development. I remember getting on the light rail and going visiting many of the station precincts and taking a lot of photos. Peter, you probably remember some of those. That was all Unbeknownst to me, we found out many years later that was all thanks to Joe. <laughs> yeah, I did a similar thing in uh, Palo Alto when I was there. Uh, yeah. But uh, certainly um, that's a beautiful story and, and uh, ha having that as, uh, as something that we could uh, push for, it, it's exactly the kind of legacy that I'm sure Joe would be very happy with. Um, so well done because it's it's come from the students and mm. then the dream is created and, and turned into something of value in the city itself. That's the diamond that I'm talking about and it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it certainly would be a wonderful thing for uh, to, to uh, remember Joe with. Mm. Yeah, that's a very nice idea. Like I mentioned, we, we definitely have the inside contacts to get that ball rolling and pull through with that. That would be uh, pretty awesome to see that come forward. Yeah. Um, so again, this was recorded and will be posted later on our YouTube channel. Uh, on the right is information for Dr. Cott's uh, nonprofit. If you'd like to donate, uh, there's vital information for that. And at this time, are there any other um, 
comments or anything any of the speakers would like to bring up or mention before we depart? I'd just like to thank Peter once again for getting up in the middle of the night. <laughs> and everyone else for coming. <laughs> it's been a joy. And, uh, uh, you know, there aren't many people that you feel the need to do this for, but Joe was certainly one of them. And uh, thank you, everyone, for organising this. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. And I, I just want to say one last thing. You showed that picture of, uh, you know, that Joe took of the crosswalk with Notre Dame Cathedral behind. I now feel closer to Joe than ever because I would have taken that photo too. I'm ashamed <laughs> to say, and much to the chagrin of everybody I know, I would be guilty of taking the photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Good. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, Cal Green and Transportica enjoyed doing this. It was without question that this was going to be set up uh, for Dr. Cott as well. Um, he was just a major influence and inspiration for us, for both Transportica and later uh, Cal Green. He was actually the very first professor we ever met that kind of provided detail about what is sustainable transportation mm -hmm. other than you don't use gasoline or petrol. Mm -hmm. So we always appreciated that and we are, you know, it's a joy for us to go forward with this and uh, help assist you folks in any way we can to carry on this legacy. So again, thank you so much for coming today. I uh, wish you all the very best and this will be posted. Thanks, Greg. Many thanks, Greg. Bye. Enjoy. Thanks Bye, everyone. So much, Greg. Uh, no See ya. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.